The next talk scheduled was, was on Dugong by Peter Bayless. Um, clearly, I'm not Peter Bayless, nor am I Marley Hutton, who's the other person on the talk, but um, neither one of those people are available to be here today. So I'm going to do this presentation on behalf of them. I apologize in advance because this is not my project and other than talking to Pete and hearing the or reading the report and hearing other presentations, I've had very little involvement in the research. So as I stumble my way through this, please bear with me. Um, so this project was on uh, looking at dugong distribution and abundance across the Kimberley and it had a very key component, component on integrating indigenous knowledge into both the survey techniques, um, the information development and in the information sharing. I'm the, one, I'm the one who should know how to use this by now, right? Okay, uh, so just as a, and again, these are all Pete slides, so I will simply just bumble my way through. Um, so just as an overview, what we're gonna, what I'm gonna be talking about today is just a, a, an overview description of what Pete undertook throughout the project. So he uh, first in, um, had a key component, component on indigenous knowledge and developing research partnerships, then set about map, mapping some baseline information on dugong distribution and abundance across the northern part of the Kimberley. That was extended then into the southern area of the Kimberley due to some, because there was such an interest in it and because there was an identified gap area. He then also did uh, include a compon component on looking at dugong movement using satellite tags. And then I'll finish up by just giving a brief outline of how this research can then be used to help manage saltwater country across population monitoring, dugong movement, and also habitat. So again, like I've said, this is um, clearly a, a very important project that involved indigenous engagement. Dugong are um, a cultural resource as well, and that's very highly recognized by Pete and his team. In uh, initiating the project, he worked predominantly with um, the four groups across the north and western Kimberley, Balangara, Wanamugambra, Dabamangari, and Bardi Jawi. And again, the dugong are identified in all of their healthy country plans as a, as a key asset, and they have their own management objectives and targets. So just as a bit of background on dugong, dugong are listed as vulnerably, vulnerable globally, and in northern Australia is home to some of the largest remaining du healthy populations of dugong. There is very limited survey information across the Kimberley with um, some historic aerial surveys having been done, some done for industry. Again, these are mainly in the southern and central Kimberley areas and with very little in the northern Kimberley. Culturally, they are a very significant um, species in value. They have deep indigenous connections and there is long-term knowledge on, of the historical knowledge on hunting practices and knowledge of dugong. Uh, currently, there are considered to be very limited human-induced human threats for dugong in the Kimberley. However, of course, we all know that this, these will continue to increase. So the overall aims of this specific project were to first develop these partnerships with the, uh, with the indigenous traditional owners of the, of the Kimberley to understand what their values and concerns were and to work with them going forward for ongoing management, conservation management of dugong. Um, Pete had a very specific focus on in integrating indigenous knowledge with the scientific knowledge to work together to monitor these populations. So again, uh, probably a very good example of some of the talks that you heard earlier in the first session today. Uh, the main aims, and especially in terms of the Whamsey perspective and some of the management questions, were around identifying dugong distribution and abundance across the, across the Kimberley. And Pete was using standard techniques for this for dugong, which is aerial survey methods. He sought to do this in partnership with the indigenous rangers and to also include a training component for them. Uh, he also wanted to develop some long-term movement studies to also better understand habitat use um, in relation to seagrass condition for, to better understand dugong populations. So clearly dugong, seagrass, big connection there. Where you find seagrass, you're likely to find dugong. That's one of the um, usual things that's used in terms of first identifying what you might find as likely habitat and where to start looking for dugong and better understand them. Seagrass are typically found in shallow coastal waters, generally within a 20 meter depth range. So again, that's where Pete was gonna focus his activities. So in order to decide how best to create a um, survey design, he started to put a few different information sources together. First of all, uh, uh, Janet Anstey from CSIRO helped Pete to develop a predictive seagrass map using Landsat imagery. Pete then also gathered some indigenous knowledge using cultural maps of important areas that are presented in healthy country plans. Pete also said about having specific interviews, discussions, and workshops with a number of traditional owner groups, and I believe Emma Woodward, who was here earlier today, assisted in that. So again, trying to in include some of that indigenous knowledge and information in the actual planning of the survey design. So Pete then put all of this information together. So he's got the cultural maps, scientific data based on the seagrass, 
uh, standard aerial survey techniques to actually set up a stratified design for how to um, survey, use aerial surveys across the Kimberley. Transects are typically spaced at five to 10 kilometers apart. By using the stratified design, he was able to um, have more transects in areas where they're going to be more likely to have dugong based on either the habitat or cultural information and less survey area and less likely areas. So in, in his terms, that ended up at about a cost savings, about 35% by being able to stratify that um, survey design. Okay, so then going about initiating the aerial surveys. First of all, Pete ran a four-day training course for a number of indigenous rangers. Um, uh, the Ungu Wanabagambra Rangers, so based up in the North Kimberley. And I believe the training was run out of Truscott, but it doesn't say there, so I'm not sure. Um, anyhow, it was an introduction to aerial survey for wildlife management. So this was a tra building capacity in not only aerial survey for dugong, but for other wildlife that could be, could be useful. So it was a general aerial survey training course. Um, over a marine environment, they learned about the methodology, the questions asked, uh, what you know required in, for an observer, and they were given a certification at the end of that course. They also included a couple of practice flights to um, you know develop their their skills to have that better you know actual operational understanding of what it's actually like in the air. They then undertook the aerial surveys. So this first set of surveys. Um, the way the surveys are run, you have two observers on each side of the plane, and they're, uh, it's a blind approach, so the front observers don't know what the back observers are, are recording and vice versa. Um, they fly at a height of 500 feet at around 100 knots, and the transect's width that they're, that they're viewing is about 200 meters. So this is your standard aerial procedure, which is typically used for dugong aerial surveys. One thing to be aware of in flying aerial surveys looking for dugong, the thing that's going to be most similar to a dugong up in the Kimberley is a snubfin dolphin. So that is something that the uh, observers were trained in, in particular in these practice sessions, to make sure that they could understand the visually seeing what, what, how snubfin and dugong may differ from an aerial perspective. And some of it's based on surface behavior, the way that they group together and things, but just to make sure that the observers all had some experience with that. There are, of course, other marine mammals that could be detected and were recorded. Not going to talk about any of those, but just to let you know, they were actually recording all this information. So there, there is, Pete has reported on these other species, but we're just focusing on dugong today. So the flights that were undertaken in October 2015 took about 18 days to do all the flights. They had actually almost exceptional weather the entire time. I think they only missed about three days due to bad weather, which is quite extraordinary for long-term aerial surveys. Uh, the indigenous rangers participated in the surveys as well. So the group that were trained were actually, um, some of them were actually involved in the actual surveys. This is just a map showing where the actual, where the, their sightings occurred across the Northern Kimberley. The ones, these, greeny ones down here were a previous Woodside survey, but again, Pete was incorporating all information available in um, some of his later work, so I've just left this map in there. In terms of results, they saw around, well, using the calculation, not this isn't how many they counted, this is using the calculation um, from the, using distance sampling. They estimated around 12,000 dugong overall sighted across the North Kimberley. And really, the other thing that's important is the density. So it's, it's written as 0.36 but to, per kilometer square. So it's about one dugong every three square kilometers. Uh, again, there was a bit of a range across the Kimberley uh, or the Northern Kimberley area in terms of density and the population, but that just gives you an overall for that area. So Pete then used this information to develop kind of a heat map to show where some of those um, more important areas and higher density areas are. And as you can see, uh, the Northern Kimberley, there are a few spots in Northern Kimberley that had very high densities. And again, a little bit over um, around Dampier Peninsula, which was from that previous Woodside survey. Okay, so what we know about now that we filled in that gap in terms of this is where aerial survey and information is available on Dugong, there was one gap left that had not been filled. And that's basically Robic Bay to 80 Mile. This was not done as part of the WAMSI research project, but the um, Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions uh, asked Pete to fill in that gap because it was relevant to both them and their joint managers of those marine park areas. So Pete also undertook that study as well. Same methodology um, involving some of the same people in, in the survey. And again, I'm not gonna go into the detail on that, but just simply to show you. So those are the blocks the, of surveys that they undertook from Roebuck Bay down to 80 Mile Beach, and that's the heat map that was developed from that. So again, um, unsurprisingly, highest densities up around Roebuck Bay. Okay, um, hmm. 
this is just a map just to show, I think I'm getting to another heat map here. Sorry, a little, <laughs> little unclear on why I have this one next. Uh, so that's just to show where all the dugongs have been sighted through the various surveys that have been undertaken probably over the last 10 years. So you've got Pete's work that's been up here, the WAMSI funded research up in that area, some Woodside and industry funded research there, the Pete's additional funded research there, and some work that um, Holly Rodino ha uh, has organized and through Chevron Wheatstone funding through Murdoch, Murdoch University down through the Pilbara. So that kind of gives us a really good picture of how much dugong information we really have across the whole range. Again, all of these aerial surveys are very much snapshots in time, but it's still giving us an understanding of, of general population distribution. So Pete's used all of the information together from the Kimberley. He didn't include the Pilbara bit in this analysis, but certainly from the Kimberley on upwards to develop a proper heat map of the entire area. And again, uh, I think some of the interesting things to note are the, the hotspot areas, Rubbock Bay and the Northern Kimberley. And Pete does say it's, it's not as clear here in the heat map, but the density, the highest densities were actually in the Northern Kimberley. This whole area, the densities here were around 0.08 as compared to that 0.3. So you're talking like, you know, a dugong every, I don't know, 10 kilometers as, as opposed to up here where there was that much higher density of one every three kilometers. So even though these are still the high abundance areas, it's a, it's a bit more of a confined high abundance area in the, in the south than there were in the north. Okay, something else that Pete's done is looking at, um, again, this is kind of reminds me of Bo's thing with the multiple evidence-based approach, where he's using a Bayesian approach to um, bring these different networks and knowledge systems together and to be able to consider them together in, in a probably a scientific and data analysis way. So Bayesian likelihood method to combine the indigenous knowledge is uh, bringing all of the, the, the different information streams together and to be able to create maps of, important, of dugong important areas. So I can't explain how any of this happens or what he did, but, um, but that is part of the approach. And again, so he's used this to, we start with our, our indigenous knowledge, indigenous important areas, the seagrass mapping, the dugong aerial surveys, and then we end up with this one which shows, so these are gonna be the important areas for dugong. The advantage to using this method too is that all of these maps can be updated over time when new knowledge becomes um, available and used to, to continue to improve this one. One slight, I'll just talk for a few minutes on the dugong movement and diving behavior. So uh, again, standard technique for doing this is using uh, satellite tags. Um, we're quite lucky that we have our own uh, an indigenous group available up in the Kimberley with a lot of experience and skills. The Barty Joey guys in um, the Dampier Peninsula have been doing dugong tagging uh, on a number of occasions and so they were more than happy to work with Pete and um, share their skills and experience with other rangers as well. So they did go out and capture dugong to, they had, ideally they wanted to put out 10 tags. And they were putting them out in what they assumed would hoped would be a high dugong density area up around the tip of Dampier Peninsula and, and up into um, Talbot Bay. However, at the time that they went out tagging, they actually only managed to tag five animals simply because there just weren't that many animals around at the time. The Barty Rangers assisted in the entire expedition with Pete and they did manage to tag five animals, four young adult males and one adult female. Unfortunately, again, none of the tags seemed to last for very long. I think the longest tag was 78 days um, and for one tag and then four of the tags came off between nine and 23 days. Um, and just to give you a, just an indication, so this isn't particularly a fantastic result in terms of being able to look at movement because it's too short term. It, was, it wasn't many animals and the tags were not long enough to really get a good understanding of the movement like we'd like to, but it's a good start. So this animal up here uh, is the female that was tagged at Talbot Bay. And um, let's see, she traveled 325 kilometers over 14 days, ending up about 75 kilometers from the place where she was actually tagged. So not a huge amount of movement in that 14 days, but still, so you can see, you know, a bit, a bit of traveling around in one area and then moving, moving a bit between locations. These ones uh, down the, with movement around Dampier Peninsula were the four, four males that were tagged. Uh, and the one in blue is the one that was on for 78 days. So that was the one, the longest term tag that they had. And again, um, 
some a reasonable amount of movement. I think he traveled over a thousand kilometers in total, but still only ended up about 85 kilometers at the end of the time from his original tag site. So again, it's about moving around, finding a little local area we'd stay for a couple of days and move around and then, and then actually coming back to a close to where he was tagged. Uh, okay, so this is just a bit about the, um, the key findings based on that, that tagging, which, Again, limited information, but what we do know, dugongs can move over large distances. They often move over um, shorter distances, and they can move a large distance in a short amount of time. We do know that they cross jurisdictions, so there's going to be boundaries that are crossed. If just because we have a marine park or a healthy country in one area does not mean the dugong that are there are going to stay there. They're going to be moving into cross into other direct other jurisdictions, which means we have to consider them a shared resource. We need to be working together in terms of their long term management. And again, this also means that we need to consider management at both a local and regional scale. So in terms of how we are gonna use this going forward, looking at research management and monitoring of dugong, well, there's a, there's a few things that we need to consider then. The population monitoring, movement monitoring, and also habitat monitoring, is that's gonna be key for their, their ongoing condition and health. Uh, in terms of long-term monitoring, so Pete had some ideas and suggestions. Again, he's actually presented this information back to the indigenous groups with he worked with, with whom he worked as well, to be able to get across to them that there, you know, that there's a range of survey methods. They ha certainly have their own skills and capacity in some of these, and there, there's ones that we can be developing together. But it's for our for the our, my department as well as um, in jo as joint managers, as well as the traditional owners to work out. The questions that they have for monitoring and what which one what means are going to suit them best. So in terms of monitoring, the aerial survey method is a good one for covering large broad scale areas. It's also quite expensive. So it's not a one size fits all that we can just use aerial surveys generally. I think it, we need to consider what the question is, what the time frame is, and um, have a good understanding of how best to use it. So looking at maybe a five to ten year uh, basis for doing aerial surveys and doing something else in between that time is something that has been considered. Now there's other methods that you can combine with, um, with doing these larger aerial surveys. You can look at something on a local and a small, on a much smaller basis. Um, using boat surveys is often quite typical for that and there's certainly some, uh, some good protocols out there for doing that. Pete's also raised the idea of using helicopters or drones um, to be able to better count and also see some of the behaviors and other things that is going, are going on with Dugong. Uh, some of the broad, the challenges to any kind of um, long-term monitoring because, again, the aerial surveys are only a snapshot in time. The boat surveys can only be, are often only on a very local area. So if we wanna actually look at an absolute population abundance, which we haven't been able to do so much yet, they have to look at considering other methods. Uh, close kin genetics is one method of doing that. And it, unfortunately, you'd require like a large number of genetic samples across the population, but it's certainly one to investigate the potential for doing this. And it's certainly one that we can keep in, investing in or our, our, um, discussing over time. The movement study, um, again, the satellite tag thing was something that has a lot of potential. It didn't work out so well in this particular season. Pete would also be very interested in using acoustic receivers and acoustic tags, which would give a much more localized information on a, on a population that's, that's got a high use or for a high use area. Somewhere like, I think this was one that, this actual picture is I think from um, Pender Bay. But really, one of the areas he's actually considering it to be a good idea for would be Roebuck Bay. So it's an area where you, you need an area where you can actually put out a set of acoustic arrays and you know the animals are going to at least spend a, a reasonable amount of time resident or in the area so that you'll actually be able to detect their movement in and around the area. So that's something he is considering for the future is actually doing some acoustic tagging in um, Roebuck Bay. And then finally, of course, looking back at habitat condition, seagrass is uh, the critical, most important habitat for dugong, and having a good understanding of dugong or of seagrass um, health and condition is gonna be uh, very important for understanding dugong, as well as being able to map this um, habitat across the Kimberley. And that's all. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of the people on Pete's behalf, that there were a number of traditional owners from a number of different groups that were involved, as well as a whole host of people that assisted in the um, various surveys. Okay, that's it.